across the world, CCTV cameras record thousands of hours of video surveillance footage daily. Among all this footage of normality, it's no surprise that these cameras sometimes capture scary moments of true crimes that disrupt the pace of everyday life. In some rare cases, CCTV cameras even capture eerie disturbances, providing a glimpse into the last known moments of a missing person. In these unique cases, the evidence of video recording is enough to prove that people went missing or to track their last moments, but it's not enough to solve their mysterious disappearances. Number 5 on Wednesday, January 15, 2014, 69-year-old grandmother Jeanette Moss was found in her apartment by a neighbor. There was no sign of forced entry, but Jeanette had been attacked and had passed away sometime on Tuesday the 14th. Investigators have been left with few clues except for the mysterious CCTV footage showing Jeanette seemingly going about her normal routine on January 14th just hours before her passing. Jeanette lived in Melbourne, Australia in the upper-class neighborhood of Middle Park. Her apartment overlooked Beaconsfield Parade and was located in one of Melbourne's most valuable neighborhoods. The neighborhood is close to the water, with some apartments even boasting beautiful views of Port Phillip Bay. Jeanette was well-liked by those who knew her and was popular in her community. At the time of her disappearance, she was in the middle of planning her upcoming 70th birthday party. Jeanette was also close with family. She had at least two adult children, a son, Durham, and a daughter, Tara, and grandchildren that she loved, including Tara's sons. Tara remembered her mother as a loving parent and grandmother, who was generous and kind with a cheeky sense of humor. Durham added that his frail mother was happy and didn't have any enemies. He told investigators that, quote, I can't possibly imagine anyone she knows would do something like this. Jeanette has been described in the press as a socialite, but she appears to have led a fairly quiet life, often running errands or visiting the gym with friends. However, Jeanette's health was also poor. She had been diagnosed with an unspecified terminal lung disease, and a friend was scheduled to take her to her appointment on the 15th of January. When Jeanette failed to come downstairs, her concerned friend entered the apartment and made the horrifying discovery. Jeanette was found in her bedroom. She'd been strangled with a piece of her own bedsheet and some of her jewelry was found to be missing from the apartment, which was otherwise in reasonable shape. The missing jewelry has been identified as a ring and a bracelet, as well as a gold necklace. A bottle of wine was found on the counter and wine glasses were found on the kitchen bench. Authorities believe that Jeanette may have gotten out the wine and glasses to offer to her assailant, who she could have known. This theory would also line up with the fact that there were no signs of forced entry. In fact, the only evidence that authorities have released is CCTV footage from the morning of January 14th, which was discovered after investigators watched thousands of hours of video. The unsettling footage is made eerie by the fact that an unsuspecting Jeanette can simply be seen going about her normal daily activities. On the 14th, Jeanette had been seen around Melbourne, running errands in her green 1997 BMW sedan. These errands included driving a friend to a pharmacy located on Bay Street. The video clip, taken inside the pharmacy, shows Jeanette walking in wearing a plain black shirt, black leggings, and white shoes. She props her sunglasses, also black, on top of her short blonde hair. A large, bright pink tote bag is the most distinguishing color in her ensemble. The purse can be seen again in newly released photos of her apartment. It's placed haphazardly on the floor by the kitchen counter. In the clips released both before and after Jeanette picks up her shopping, she seems to pause for an extended period of time, looking all around her. She's probably just waiting for her friend, but knowing what we do now, it's difficult for watchers not to attribute strange motives to her actions. Based on an investigation conducted in 2022, police have concluded her life ended just hours after the footage was recorded. Sometime between 12.47 and 2.52 p.m. on Tuesday, January 14th. In January of 2023, Melbourne police made a shocking announcement. 
They've begun to offer a $1 million reward for credible information leading to the identity of Jeanette's attacker. The Homicide Squad Detective Inspector, Paul Scarlett, told reporters that after nine years of investigation, they're hopeful that a reward will draw out additional information. Although 31 people of interest have been identified over the years, all have been ruled out as the attacker. Paul said in a statement that, quote, this was a brutal crime involving a vulnerable member of the community alone in her home, and investigators are working hard to find justice for Jeanette. Jeanette's children have remained cooperative with the investigation and have continued to speak regularly with reporters and police in hopes of furthering their search for justice. In 2023, Durham told Nine News that there hasn't been a day when he hasn't been heartbroken by the loss of his mother. Similarly, Tara has said that she lost her best friend that day. Anyone with information about Jeanette's passing is asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000 or to submit a confidential online report at crimestoppersvic.com.au. Number 4. Vicki Glass was born on September 21, 1979, in Cleveland, in the Yorkshire region of England. She had one older sister as well as an older stepsister and a half-brother. Her childhood was quiet, full of love and family. Along with her siblings, she attended the Blakeston Secondary School in the town of Stockton-on-Tees. As a child, Vicki was quiet and shy around those she didn't know well. But with her family and close friends, she was bubbly and caring. As she got older, she began to enjoy socializing more and more. When Vicky was a teenager, she became heavily involved in the Kiora Hall Jazz Band. From the ages of 13 to 18, she traveled regularly with the group, often performing for large crowds. However, Vicky aged out of the band, and according to her parents, her lifestyle seemed to change once she lost this focus point. Vicky had obtained five GSCEs, British academic qualifications that 15 and 16 year old students obtained at the completion of year 11 of their education. Upon receiving this qualification, students may choose to continue school for an additional two years and sit for advanced A-level exams or join the workforce. In Vicky's case, she secured a job at the Sweet and Savory factory in nearby Teesside after completing her GCSE. Although the specific timeline is unclear, Vicky may have continued to be a member of the Kiora Hall Jazz Band while she worked at the factory. However, it's definitive that she left the band when she turned 18. As a young adult, newly out of school and out of her primary hobby, Vicky may have felt adrift. It was here that her parents and investigators on her case alleged that she reached an unfortunate crossroads. The vivacious young woman fell in with a dark crowd of exploitative individuals involved in the drug trade and even trafficking. It was through this social group that Vicky was first introduced to heroin, an extremely addictive illegal drug. She quickly became addicted and within a period of just a few years, found herself unemployed and homeless. In order to fund her costly addiction, Vicky turned to selling her body. Of her situation, her family later said in a statement that, quote, Vicky was a vulnerable woman who was exploited by men. She was not a sex worker by choice, but forced by circumstances as a young adult. She had her whole life ahead of her and was loved by her family. Vicky was known to practice her trade in the Cannon Park area of a North Yorkshire town on the bank of the River Tees. It's the main town of the local council area, and although it's just a few miles west of where she grew up, the town seemed a world away, both to Vicky and her concerned parents. Around Christmas of 1999, Vicky, homeless and suffering from a devastating chest infection, agreed to move in with a male friend who lived in the area, meaning that she could spend more time offering her services and making money for drugs. In particular, she frequented parking lots where trucks were known to stay overnight. For nearly a year, Vicky remained at the unidentified man's home in Petch Close in Middlesbrough. Although she was recovering from her infection, she continued to use drugs and sell her body which contributed to her overall ill health. On Sunday, September 24, 2000, at just after 4 a.m., Vicky called a taxi to pick her up at a client's house. After a short ride, she got out of the car on Union Street, just to the rear of a pub called The Shipmate. 
The taxi driver drove away and returned to his firm's office. He was the last person to ever see Vicky alive. She had turned 21 just three days prior. In the days after September 24th, the man who Vicky lived with realized she was missing and quickly contacted the police. She also spoke to other people in the area, including Vicky's friends and associates, none of whom reported having seen her. A missing persons investigation was launched by the Cleveland police. Investigators were able to put together a fairly detailed timeline of the last days Vicky was seen. She was associated with a number of individuals who also worked in the same trade as well as those who were drug users. She was well known and noticeably absent. On Sunday, September 23rd, Vicky and a friend left her resident on Petch Clothes around midday to go and find clients for their work. Sometime after midnight, Vicky and the client traveled to a home on Prince's Road, which was well known to those involved in the underground markets of Middlesbrough. After a few hours, Vicky went to her client's home in Stockton. It was from here that she would hail the taxi that took her back to the shipmate on Union Street. It's worth noting that Union Street is also where Vicky and the client picked up the taxi after visiting the home on Prince's Road. Vicky may have been returning there when she asked the cab driver to drop her off on Union. However, where she went next remains unknown, even to this day. Although Vicky's movements on the 23rd and into the evening of the 24th were reasonably well tracked, investigators were not able to pinpoint what happened after the taxi dropped her off. And tragically, the missing person investigation shifted into something more serious when on Friday, November 3rd, Vicky's body was discovered in Danby, a village in North Yorkshire approximately 20 miles away from Middlesbrough. Vicky's remains had been placed in a stream and identification was difficult. There were no traces of her attacker left behind, and any evidence had presumably been left behind by time or nature. Notably, investigators have not released her cause of death. This is a slightly unusual maneuver which may indicate that police are playing their cards close to their chest in an attempt to draw out the attacker even more than 20 years later. Vicky's case received renewed attention in 2021 when Cleveland Police's Historical Investigation Unit began to reinvestigate her passing with modern forensic techniques. It was in this review that police found a major clue which had been overlooked 20 years prior, CCTV footage which appeared to show Vicky on the last day that she was known to be alive. A thorough review of more than 200 hours of footage from the time of Vicky's disappearance turned up video of Vicky and her friend in the Cannon Park area of Middlesbrough on the afternoon of September 23rd. The footage, which was newly released to the public on November 4th, 2022, shows the clothes Vicky was wearing on that fateful day. A dark puffer jacket with light colored pants, top and sneakers. In addition, the CCTV footage provided fateful clues as to the identity of Vicky's friend, a potential key informant in her case. The unidentified friend who was likely involved in illegal activities with Vicky told police that she remembers Vicky having a conversation with a truck driver on the afternoon of September 23rd. She added that Vicky and the driver had plans to meet later that evening. Based on this new evidence, the truck driver is a major person of interest to investigators who are actively working Vicky's case. The man was white in his mid thirties with a broad build and a mole on his face. The Cleveland Police website describes identifying this individual as a significant line of inquiry for the investigation team. In addition, the department returned to the town of Danby in November of 2022 to try to collect statements from local residents. However, whether or not this video or the information it's revealed has led to any leads in Vicky's case is unclear. Four people have been arrested in connection since 2000, but all have been released with no further actions taken. The investigation remains active. Anyone with information about Vicky Glass, the truck driver she was seen speaking with, or anything that may be relevant to the case is urged to contact the Cleveland Police or Crime Stoppers. Per the Cleveland Police website, individuals should contact the Operation Ardent Investigation Team at the department by calling 01642 301 773. Investigators also maintain a website for Vicky's case which can be found at vickyglass.co.uk.
Number 3 Gretchen Fleming, age 27, is one of the US's most recent missing person cases. She was last seen on December 3rd, 2022 and is still missing less than two years later. In her absence, her family marked her 28th birthday on December 24th. Gretchen's case has been at the center of a national flurry of media attention, perhaps because of the CCTV footage that places her in the car and possibly the home of a strange man who she met at the bar on the night that she was last seen. Gretchen Fleming grew up in West Virginia. Friends from that time remember her as a loving, social girl with a contagious laugh. A Facebook post asking for stories or testimonials as to her past brought in more than a dozen comments from those in the region, including several young adults who grew up with Gretchen. Her childhood friends wrote that they loved to perform at home musicals and plays and that she always had an annual sleepover on the first day of Christmas break to celebrate her birthday, which was on Christmas Eve. High school friends wrote about her music, her fashion sense, and her love of Paramore. One remembered listening to a cover she recorded of the song Simmer. By all accounts, Gretchen was well-liked. She was born and raised in West Virginia, but she left for college, traveling to William Peace University and Shaw University in North Carolina to study political science. As of December of 2022, she had recently returned to West Virginia and for the past six months had been staying with her grandmother in the town of Vienna. Her friends and family have described adult Gretchen as a creative person with an independent spirit and a great personality. A longtime friend told NBC that Gretchen valued her independence and sense of fashion. He also added that, quote, she's so creative, music is a big part of who she is. She's done all these different things. She's traveled. She's very well spoken. She used to be a writer and still does write. Gretchen had recently taken a job at an H&M store at her local mall and was in the process of rebuilding her roots in the West Virginia community. On the evening of December 3rd, 2022, Gretchen spent the night out with a friend at multiple bars and restaurants in the Parkersburg, West Virginia area. Parkersburg is just a few miles south of Vienna, but is a much bigger city with a built up downtown and more than 300,000 residents. Gretchen and her friend started the evening at the Front Row, a sports bar and grill in Parkersburg. Although the identity of her friend has not been confirmed, police have said that this individual is not a person of interest in Gretchen's case. Gretchen reportedly left the Front Row at around 11 p.m. on December 3rd. The first sign that something might have been unusual that night occurred as she was leaving. The young woman left behind her purse, cell phone, and money. This was likely an accident, but what was unusual was that Gretchen didn't immediately return for her belongings, not that night or the following morning. Employees of the front row held on to Gretchen's belongings for a week until December 11th when her father came to pick them up. Gretchen, who doesn't own a car, left the front row with another friend who is also considered a person of interest in her case. She and her companion arrived at the My Way Lounge, also located in Parkersburg, sometime before midnight on the 3rd. For the next two hours, Gretchen stayed at My Way, where she was able to be served despite not having an ID or a wallet. Commenters on Facebook have theorized that the bartenders at My Way knew Gretchen well, and that she may have had an open tab or the ability to create one at the establishment. The My Way staff and ownership have collaborated with police, so presumably this question has been addressed. However, investigators have not released any official answers. Whatever the case, it's clear that Gretchen remained at the My Way Lounge until about 3 a.m. on December 4th. While she was there, Gretchen met a man who she would eventually leave with and who would become the primary person of interest in her missing person case. Although investigators have not released the man's name, multiple media outlets have confirmed that he's 55-year-old Preston Pierce. In the very early morning hours of December 4th, Preston offered Gretchen a ride and she accepted. Video surveillance from the My Way Lounge shows the two leaving the bar and heading to Preston's vehicle a dark-colored Nissan Rogue with Darth Vader decals on the back windows. However, their entry into the car is not captured because of where it was parked. Thus, the walk from the bar towards Preston's car is the last time Gretchen has been seen in nearly two months. 
Because Gretchen didn't live with her parents, they didn't immediately report her missing. However, after several days of not hearing from their daughter, they filed a missing persons report on December 12th, and investigators sprung into action. They were able to trace Gretchen's timeline of her night out and quickly got in touch with Preston, a former police officer himself. He told them that he gave Gretchen a ride, but that she got out of the car at some point before they reached his house. Preston's statements have been inconsistent and vague, and since first communicating with police, he's clammed up and stopped cooperating. Because of this, investigators have had to rely on alternative methods to gather information about his and Gretchen's movements. As early as December 29th, police asked residents of the Parkersburg area to review footage from their home security cameras on December 3rd and 4th. On December 30th, they also released high-quality images of the car from all angles to local media sites so that residents could compare it to evidence from private footage. From this appeal, police have put together a timeline of the car's travels for at least two miles on the 4th, confirming that it was driven towards Preston's house. They've not been able to confirm that Preston stopped at any point and dropped Gretchen off like he claimed. Preston has not been arrested, nor have police spoken further about his involvement in the case. Their most recent statement, published January 12th of 2023, focused on reassuring the community of their ongoing commitment to bringing Gretchen home. In the statement, Parkersburg Police Chief Matt Board said that because, quote, we're not releasing some aspects of information that some people would like us to, does not mean that we don't have information. That does not mean that we're not actively and aggressively pursuing the case. But while looking for Gretchen, we also have to protect the integrity of the investigation, in and of itself. Meanwhile, while the police department gathers intelligence, online attention has continued to mount around Preston Pierce and his role in Gretchen's mysterious disappearance. Preston is known to have worked for several police departments in West Virginia, including Barber and Jackson counties, as well as the Vienna Police Department. After his retirement from the force, he reportedly became a delivery driver with the food service DoorDash, servicing the general Parkersburg area. Commenters on Facebook have gathered to share their experiences with Preston, with more than 15 individuals sharing a range of concerning interactions. Those who ordered DoorDash and had him as their delivery driver remarked that he seemed to ignore appropriate boundaries, including multiple reports of him returning to the scene of deliveries hours later to tell women that they were beautiful. Another woman claimed that she eventually contacted DoorDash about how uncomfortable Preston was making her when he repeatedly accepted deliveries from her address and insisted on lingering nearby, only to be told that the company had collected multiple similar reports about his behavior. Women also claimed that Preston exhibited unusual behavior in a variety of other situations. One Facebook post from 2017 in a local yard sale group exhorted people not to buy or sell anything from Preston, who also went by Daryl Lott, as he would regularly agree on a price and then backtrack before asking women to meet without their husbands present. The poster said that Preston would then obsess for years about the interaction before blasting women again on social media. But perhaps most troubling were screenshots of an interaction between Preston and a 15-year-old girl on social media, which have been provided to the Parkersburg Police Department and made publicly available on Facebook by the adult who reported the message. In the images which have not been verified by investigators, a profile belonging to Preston can be seen messaging the teen and asking her to go out to dinner with him. Preston then sent several suggestive messages, implying that the teenager knew what sweet thing he wanted to eat and could take the long drive back to his house with him. According to the poster, the teenager had felt comfortable messaging Preston because he was the father of one of her friends. However, after the messages turned inappropriate, she turned to the adults in her life and cut off communication. The adult who posted the screenshots of the conversation said that she didn't report the interactions until January of 2023, when Preston became a person of interest in Gretchen's case. However, now that this behavior has been reported, she's hopeful that it'll be of help to investigators as they work to find Gretchen. Police have executed search warrants on Preston's home, car, and electronic devices, including his phone. They're reportedly still waiting on the results of these searches. 
as of January 20th, 2023, Preston has not been charged for his role in Gretchen's case. However, he's not been able to provide a consistent story as to where she went the night in December once she reportedly left his car. Investigators continue to work Gretchen's case. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Parkersburg Police Department at 304-424-8444 or lead detective James Zimmerman at 304-424-1072. There's currently a $65,000 reward for information in her case. Gretchen's father has created a GoFundMe for the investigation called Bring Gretchen Home. There's also an active Facebook group dedicated to Gretchen's case called Gretchen Fleming, West Virginia, TCR. Number two. John P. Wheeler III, known to his friends as Jack, was a well-respected military man with a long career working as a White House aide and in federal politics. Yet in 2010, the dignified man met an undignified end when he was killed and placed anonymously in a dumpster. The mystery of who would want to attack a 66-year-old former political aide deepened when CCTV footage from the days prior to Jack's death surfaced, showing the normally reserved man acting deeply strange and perhaps even frightened. It's a mystery that's baffled investigators for more than 10 years, ever since Jack's body was found on December 31st, 2010. Prior to his passing, Jack led a distinguished life. Born in Laredo County, Texas in 1944, Jack was raised in a military family. His father, John Wheeler II, had served as a colonel for the U.S. Army and as the eldest of three children. Jack knew that he wanted to join the tradition. After graduating high school, he attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, graduating in 1966 as a distinguished candidate. From there, he began his military career as a fire control platoon leader at a nuclear site in New Jersey. In 1968, Jack entered Harvard University as a graduate student in strategic programs and system analysis. And in 1969, he flew out to the U.S. Army headquarters in Vietnam. Jack left active duty in 1971 and pursued a law degree from Yale University. After graduation, he took a job working for the Federal Government Securities and Exchange Commission. He spent much of his career working in Washington, D.C. on a number of public and private projects, including as an aide to three different presidents, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and George H.W. Bush. Since the 1980s, he was heavily involved with a number of charity organizations, including those that support Vietnam veterans as well as deaf individuals. By the late 2000s, he was consulting with the U.S. military on cyber weaponry and technology. In 2008, he received the Air Force Exceptional Civilian Service Award. A short biography posted about his work in 2009 spans four pages when another person might have maxed out at one or two. By all accounts, Jack was an exceptional individual. Yet, despite his work for the military, there didn't seem to be any specific reason to target him for the attack, which took his life in 2010. Jack's wife, Catherine Kleitz, even told reporters that while he'd made lots of enemies in his career with the national defense industry, nobody would want to kill him. The case is a total mystery. Perhaps the most useful clue in Jack's unsolved case is CCTV footage, which captures his movements in the days leading up to December 31st. The footage is baffling at best and alarming at worst, but it may provide a crucial clue in the attempts to understand what happened to Jack. Jack was known as a very intense man, who could sometimes come off as blunt or even aggressive. He's been described as a bulldog. A good friend described him to a reporter as a complicated man of very intense and sometimes changeable friendships, passions and causes. It wasn't unusual for him to ruffle feathers. Jack had also been known to struggle with his mental health. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and in 2004, he was hospitalized for a short period during a manic episode. However, his distinguished career clearly indicates that his mental status did not majorly hold him back. Catherine also confirmed that Jack was on medication and took it consistently although he sometimes ran out because he traveled so much. Catherine and Jack married in 1997, when each already had two children from previous relationships, 
and although their marriage was happy, it was unconventional. Catherine said that Jack wasn't suited for domestic life and would live at Washington, D.C.'s exclusive Metropolitan Club, a private members-only organization frequented by high-ranking members of government and international power players. The pair had separate homes, with her in New York City and him in Newcastle, Delaware, located between New York and D.C. On December 24, 2010, Jack arrived in New York to spend the holiday with his wife. The pair were set to go out to dinner on December 27, but Catherine said that Jack felt sick, so she went without him and returned home late. When she woke up the following day, he had already left. This was not unusual and she expected to see him again in New York in a few days, when they had plans to travel together to a friend's wedding in Boston. However, Catherine never saw her husband again. Authorities have been able to put together a timeline of Jack's movements in the days between when he was last seen and when his body was discovered on December 31st. Using his cell phone records and eyewitness accounts, they've determined that Jack headed to Washington, D.C. on the 28th, where he dined at the Metropolitan Club before presumably heading home to Newcastle that evening. Late that evening, at around 11.30 p.m., firefighters were called to a property across the street from Jack's home. The partially built house at that property was a particularly sore spot for Jack, who contended that the home would block his view of the Delaware River. In addition, he had called the building on the site, which was the location of the Revolutionary War battle, sacrilegious, and he had gone so far as to sue the property owner. On the evening of December 28th, an unidentified man wearing a hooded sweatshirt lobbed smoke bombs onto the first floor of the home. A neighbor witnessed the crime and said that the man's build matched that of Jack. In addition, Jack's cell phone was discovered in the home on January 7th, further increasing suspicions that he was responsible for the strange attack. However, his potential role has never been confirmed. It's known that Jack lost his cell phone on the evening of the 28th because on the morning of December 29th, he sent an email to an unidentified person or persons, saying that his home had been broken into and his cell phone, badge, and briefcase were missing. Around the same time, Jack also emailed his therapist, saying that he'd had a fight with his wife and felt dazed and boxed into a corner. At around 9 a.m., he got into a taxi just outside the train station in Wilmington, and he was dropped off at the Hotel de Pont. It's unclear whether Jack spent the evening of December 28th at the home in Newcastle, or whether he'd gotten off a train in Wilmington on the morning of the 29th. The two cities are located about six miles apart, not a far distance by any means, but also not a distance Jack would likely travel on foot. Jack was not confirmed to be in Newcastle until later on the 29th, when a camera captured him at a pharmacy near his home. He reportedly was known to frequent the location and knew the pharmacist. According to multiple sources, Jack asked the pharmacist and potentially even the patrons of the pharmacy for a ride back to Wilmington. He claimed he'd left his car there before the Christmas holiday. At around 6.40 p.m., Jack was recorded on CCTV again, this time at a parking garage at the county courthouse in Wilmington. It was this bizarre footage that would draw the most attention to his case in the coming days and weeks, and for good reason. On the recording, Jack appears to be disheveled. He's limping slightly, and he's holding one of his torn shoes in his hand. Although it was the middle of winter, Jack is not wearing a coat or carrying one in the video. Distressed, he approaches the attendant's desk but continues to look around looking confused. The attendant told police that he was asking if she knew where his car was parked. She requested his parking ticket number, but said that it was in his briefcase which had been stolen. According to some sources, he repeatedly told her about the stolen briefcase during their short interaction, and also told her several times that he wasn't drunk. The attendant told police Jack seemed distressed and disoriented. He also said he wanted to stay inside the garage to warm up before paying for his parking but ultimately left when he couldn't locate the car. Investigators would later locate Jack's vehicle parked at the Amtrak station, not the courthouse parking lot where he'd been searching for it. It had been parked there since December 13th, and it was not unusual for him to leave it there for extended periods while he traveled between DC and NYC. After about half an hour, Jack exited the parking lot 
Although his movements over the course of the evening have not been confirmed, investigators also believe that Jack may have spent the night on the 29th and the morning of the 30th in the basement of a high-rise in Wilmington. At around 8 a.m. on the 30th, he paid in cash for a coffee at a Subway store on Delaware Avenue. The store's owner, Dan Maxwell, noted Jack's unusual appearance. He wore the same dress slacks and white shirt that he did in the parking garage surveillance footage, but the shirt was filthy, as if he'd been living in it for some time, according to Dan. Dan suspected that Jack was homeless. In the afternoon of the 30th, Jack, looking disheveled and confused, visited the offices of a law firm, Conley Bove Lodge and Hutch, in the Namor building, which were representing him in his lawsuit case against his neighbor. He asked to speak to a partner but left the firm before the receptionist returned to answer his question. Afterwards, he visited the small business administration office in the building's 11th floor and asked for a ride to Philadelphia. As late as 8.30 p.m. on the 30th, Jack was placed by multiple witnesses inside or directly in front of the Namor building. Several people said they offered to help him, but he refused. Video footage from outside of the Namor building on the evening of December 30th shows Jack still limping, walking across Market Street towards the city's rough east side. He's last seen at 8.42 p.m. on the 30th. At 10 a.m. on December 31st, Jack's body was discovered in a dumpster that had been taken to Cherry Island Landfill. He'd passed away due to blunt force trauma sometime in the past 14 hours. Tightening the timeline even further was the fact that investigators were able to trace the route of the garbage truck on December 31st. The truck had stopped to pick up 10 dumpsters along its route in Newark, Delaware, which is approximately 15 miles from Wilmington. Many of the dumpsters were either locked or watched by surveillance cameras, leading investigators to narrow down the site of Jack's body to one of the early in the route locations. That meant that he'd likely been placed in the dumpster no later than 4.30 a.m., just a few short hours after he was last seen in Wilmington. Police quickly ruled out robbery as the motive in Jack's case, as he was still wearing his West Point ring and Rolex watch, and his wallet was found with him. They also ruled out the potential of him crawling into the dumpster for shelter, as the conditions of his wounds indicated an attack. However, other than that, no one has come forward and no arrests have been made in more than 10 years. Jack's story was recently featured on the Netflix show Unsolved Mysteries, which drew renewed attention to his case in 2022. For her part, Catherine Kleiss, Jack's widow, thinks he may have met some kind of targeted foul play. In 2011, she told reporters that she'd seen the footage of Jack and that she believed he looked frightened rather than disoriented. The investigation of Jack's passing is ongoing, and anyone with information is asked to contact the Newark, Delaware Police Department. As of 2011, the lead investigator on Jack's case was Detective Nicholas Sansa. You can contact him at 302-3466-7110, extension 135. Informants can also submit anonymous information by calling Crime Stoppers at 1-800-TTIP-333 or by texting 302-NPD to tip 411. Number 1 Damien Nettles was a regular teenager growing up on the Isle of Wight, located off the south coast of England. He was always a joker and class clown, who was reportedly not always appreciated by teachers, but his parents say that he didn't have a bad bone in his body. As a young boy, he had a deep interest in music. He took trombone lessons and made the school orchestra, but he mostly enjoyed playing guitar in a band with his friends. He had an older sister, Sarah, who he helped study for her university exams. He was starting to talk about university himself and he was thinking of marine biology. Then on the evening of November 2nd, 1996, Damien vanished without a trace. He was never seen again. Today, that young man would be 46 years old. His parents have not given up hope that they will one day find their son again. November 2nd, 1996 was a Saturday evening, and Damien had plans to go to a friend's house party in East Coast. His parents had given the 16-year-old permission to stay out until midnight. At around 7 p.m., Damien called his girlfriend to chat with her before his night out. Then his dad drove him to the home of his best friend, Chris Boone. Damien, Chris, and Chris's brother, Davey, headed over to the party together. 
A short time after arriving at the party, Damien and Chris decided to head out early. Chris later told police that Damien was bored, while Davey suspected that the pair wanted to buy marijuana. The pair took a small ferry across the river to West Coast at approximately 9.30 p.m. and stopped to buy ciders in a shop. Damien had taken a small black camera with him from the house party, which he used to take pictures of himself and his friends. It has never been recovered. Damien's movements on the evening of the 2nd were later tracked by CCTV and a police inquiry, a document produced by investigators in a 2007 review of the case, which was acquired by BBC News, reveals a nearly minute-by-minute -minute reporting of his movements down to West Coast High Street that evening. From approximately 9.30 until 10.30, Damien and Chris, who were underage, walked along the main street trying to get into various pubs that lined the strip. Damien, who was 6 foot 4 inches and looked older than his age, found it easy to pass for an adult. However, Chris was much smaller and was often left outside the bar. By 10.30 p.m., Chris was cold and ready to go home. He convinced Damien to walk out of town towards home and the two parted ways at the entrance of Northwood Park. Chris thought Damien had turned towards his home at the park entrance. That's what he had done at least. However, for reasons that are still unclear, Damien turned back towards the West Coast High Street after dropping off his friend. For the next hour and a half, he was seen in the area by multiple witnesses who said he'd been acting strangely, as if he was drunk or drugged. At 11.15, a witness saw him trying locked car door handles on a blue Ford Fiesta parked outside of the Harbor Lights pub. At approximately 11.35, a CCTV camera at Yorkie's Fish and Chip Shop captured the last still existing footage of the young man. Damien was reportedly acting strangely and stumbling over his words. In the footage, he can be seen chatting with a group of men at the counter, who were later identified as members of the British Army. According to chip shop employees, Damien's behavior didn't seem like he was run-of-the-mill drunk. He was acting almost as if he had been drugged. After visiting the chip shop, Damien was seen at a bus stop, where he boarded the bus, talked to the driver, and took a photo on his camera, before getting back off the bus again. Another witness who was at the bus stop at approximately 11.59 confirmed that there was a man who matched Damien's description hanging out at the bus stop despite the cold and rainy weather. The man, who the witnesses suspect was Damien, approached his car and twice said to him, they're watching us. He then walked away back towards the street. However, this sighting has never been officially confirmed. Police have revealed that Damien was seen on CCTV footage from the street at 12.06 a.m. on November 3rd, but this footage has since been lost. After 12.06, there was no sign of Damien. What friends and loved ones have continued to wonder for 20 years is how Damien so cleanly avoided all of the area's CCTV cameras after 12.06. His movements are thoroughly accounted for between 10.30 and 12 a.m., even though he was on his own. Yet, after midnight, it's like no one saw him. Investigative journalist Alice Hart, who helped produce a documentary series about Damien's case, told Vice News reporters that, quote, up until a few minutes after midnight, it's almost minute by minute, the eyewitness accounts of where Damien was and who he was speaking to. And then it stops. How did a 16-year-old boy disappear? Damien's family reported him missing the day after he failed to return home, after they were unable to locate him at the homes of his friends or anywhere else. According to his parents, Hampshire police did not take his absence seriously, and at first even mistakenly listed him as 19 years old not an endangered minor. Damien's parents allege this initial mishandling also accounts for the loss of crucial CCTV footage from after midnight on the 3rd. In addition, Damien's mother, Valerie, felt particularly misaligned by the police department, who she believes labeled her as a hysterical mother. She also believes that the police failed to take into account information that she had gathered about Damien's movements and focused too heavily on their own internal theories. From the beginning of the investigation, it's been alleged that Damien fell into or otherwise entered the water. West and East Coes are separated from each other by the River Medina. However, some, including a family friend, have felt that the focus on the water was one directional and pulled away from other leads. Damien's family have spoken extensively to local sailors and fishermen, 
who believed that if Damien had fallen into the water that night, his remains would have since been found. The then harbor master, Captain Henry Wrigley, calculated that tidal movements on the evening of the 3rd would have brought Damien back to shore within two or three days. However, no remains were ever found, and a search of the water didn't turn up any clues. In 2007, more than 10 years after Damien was last seen, a pro bono private investigator named Ivor Edwards began working on his case. In particular, Ivor was helpful in building connections in the community who might have witnessed Damien's movements or understood his potential involvement in the illegal drug trade, likely as mostly an innocent bystander. Following increased attention to the case, Hampshire police made eight arrests on the charges of conspiracy to murder in 2011. However, after a long period, all suspects were released without charge. Damien's case has also been plagued by rumors, most notably those surrounding Nikki McNamara, a local drug dealer in the Coase area. An informant reportedly told Damien's family that he believed Nikki had killed the young man during an argument over Damien's purchasing of cannabis. The informant claimed that Nikki had punched Damien but had not intended to kill him, and when he died, he panicked and hid the body. Nikki had passed away in 2003 and could not be questioned by the time the informant came forward, in 2010. However, when Damien's mother Valerie took this information to the police, she was told that they knew of the confidential informant and had deemed his information unreliable. They had first investigated Nikki as early as 2002 and had ruled him out as a suspect. Despite this, rumors about Nikki continued to spread, and his name is usually brought up whenever online sleuths delve into Damien's case. Tragically though, without new evidence coming to light, it's unlikely that Damien will ever be located. According to Hampshire police, more than 1,130 people have been involved in the investigation, either as witnesses, investigators, or people of interest. Since 2007, police have believed that the young man was likely murdered. However, it would appear that they're no closer to finding an explanation even in 2023. In 2019, Valerie published her account of Damien's disappearance in a book called The Boy Who Disappeared. She continues to be a tireless advocate for justice. In May of 2022, she wrote in the Facebook group Justice for Damien Nettles that she has, quote, tried to make something positive out of all of this in memory of Damien, working with other families supported by the Missing People charity to bolster the support system already in place. She urges anyone with new information to contact the Hampshire police, as well as Herb directly via email. Valerie can be reached at valnettles at damiennettles.uk. The Hampshire Constabulary can be called within Britain by dialing 101 and quoting Operation Ridgewood. Callers may also submit information anonymously by contacting Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 111. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.